Good morning, everyone. I am Namita Vahi, and on behalf of the Center for Policy Research and the Land Rights Initiative, I am very pleased to welcome all of you to our fourth annual conference on land laws, land acquisition, and scheduled areas in India. At this conference, we are uh, launching our report on the legal regime and political economy of land rights of scheduled tribes in the scheduled areas of India. This report is the outcome of a five-year-long project, uh, five years of work uh, on this issue, which was a collaboration between the Center for Policy Research and the Center on Law and Social Transformation. And I'm very uh, happy uh, that you know Professor Siri Gloppin, who is a professor of comparative politics at the University of Bergen and uh, uh, also senior fellow at the Center on Law and Social Transformation at CMI, a uh, research think tank in Norway, is actually, has been actually able to make it here because the project has uh, been over and uh, not all our collaborators could be here, but a very fortunate circumstance brought her here and with us today. So, uh, you know, four years ago, we gathered in this very room to actually uh, start thinking and talking about these issues. And, uh, you know, many people have worked on this report. My uh, team especially, uh, you know, on my right is Ankit Bhatia, uh, and on my left is Soumya Jha. Uh, you'll be seeing a lot of us throughout the course of the day have really been instrumental, not only on, in the working on this report, uh, which is this one, uh, but also this report, which we launched last year, which is on the uh, on uh, land acquisition cases, uh, where we'll also, in the course of this day, we'll be talking about uh, our research on the scheduled areas project, as well as on land acquisition, especially uh, the updated research that we have done since this last report came out in March of last year. Um, but I'm also uh, very, very happy that in these four years, we've actually, from the first time that we had a conversation about these issues uh, four years ago, uh, for the you know to bring together people working on the scheduled areas, both fifth and sixth scheduled areas, to today we have many many people who have been part of that journey with us, and I'm very happy to see many of them in this room. We have uh, Ravi Rebbapragada, Amrish Mehta, Dr. Shastri, uh, Walter Fernandez, uh, people who have been with us uh, on these working on these issues, but also very happy to welcome Professor Huck, who has been very very supportive on all our research on land rights, and mm -hmm. this project has really been instrumental because, and I think it's a great example of uh, research collaboration collaboration between countries because this is a project under the Indian-Norwegian research collaboration and uh, I'm very pleased to see that we also have some members from the Norwegian Embassy here. Uh, so, uh, you know, welcome to all of you. And uh, essentially, uh, what we are, uh, what we are going to speak about next is uh, findings from this research study, followed by two panels of uh, of discussions on these on these issues. And then uh, later in the afternoon, we are going to have a discussion on the panel on land acquisition. Uh, but uh, but I think that it has been. Uh, but our, I also want to mention our collaborators on this research from the Norwegian side, who uh, are not here today, but uh, who were very important in the work. And that's Kavita Sorede and uh, Hugo Stocker. Uh, so without further ado, I will uh, start with the presentation, but perhaps uh, uh, since we have the, the pleasure of having Siri here, maybe Siri would like to say a few words and then we can start with the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Namita. Um, I'm really, really happy to be here again. I've been here at previous conferences and I've found the discussions incredibly useful. As Namita said, the project is over, the funding is over, and it wasn't clear that I could be here, but we are continuing work on other projects, so we made it, uh, we've, I've been able to come for other work as well. So uh, I just want to take this opportunity to thank Namita and Ankit in particular, but the whole team for doing an incredible job with this report. It is so interesting and it has, contains so much information and it's so much work that goes into this report. Uh, and I think uh, you will all get more of a sense of this today. And I would also like to, to sort of, I also want to say that I'm very impressed by the way in which Namita and her team has been able to use this, this project that we've had together and uh, that I've had the pleasure of, of sort of being the formal leader for, um, that they've been able to build the land rights initiative at CPR in this period, uh, joining with other projects, doing amazing work on land acquisition, on land laws, compilation of land laws, and also this work on the scheduled areas. So um, I'm looking forward to further research 
collaboration on this that I'm sure we'll get in the soon near future, and also to working with you on other issues. So thank you so much. Thank you, Siri. And uh, Siri's also already mentioned uh, the land laws project, which we'll be talking about tomorrow. So essentially, we are presenting research from three projects. And uh, like, like I mentioned uh, before, and, uh, that you know, the Schedule Errors project has been over. But we have been working on trying to make sure that uh, we, we adequately represent all the issues. Uh, the, the land acquisition project is also continuing. And we have a, a project from which, uh, on land laws, where we are trying to compile a database of all land laws in India. And it's a first attempt for seven states. And that will be uh, the discussions for tomorrow will center around our preliminary findings from that study. So, um, so, so with that, I think uh, we'll start with the presentation on the Scheduled Areas uh, project. So um, the report that has come out of the, the work on this project is our major output. But uh, in the course of these years, we've actually collected a lot of information on uh, these issues. And so what we're going to present today uh, will include certain things that you may not find a lot of discussion on in the report. But there, these are certainly things and works in progress. Uh, on these issues. And I, I can say this, that this, even though this report has been in the making for the last five years, it remains a work in progress, simply because there is so much complexity to the issues of scheduled uh, tribes and scheduled areas. And, and, and you know, it's, it's really interesting that even though the people who work on these issues are so enmeshed within them, the larger public is largely unaware of them. And, and I can say this because as someone who was completing a doctorate on the right to property at Harvard, I actually had never learned about the scheduled areas while I was in law school or afterwards. And you find that that is across the board in all undergraduate and postgraduate studies. It's a very specialized group of people who work on scheduled areas. And part of what uh, my attempt has been with the Land Rights Initiative is to actually bring these con conversations into the mainstream and actually have a broader debate because in, in some ways, land relations and, uh, and laws and land laws and you know professor Hark will probably speak more about it are are very fragmented but at the same time there is a, an, a unifying principle as well and so how can we have these conversations together and how, how can we put these things together and actually create equitable and efficient land regimes and land rights for all so can we move to the first slide yeah next one the so central question that we have been trying to answer in this project and in this study has been uh, the fact that we, in, we have a very pioneering constitution in India. In 1950 itself, we not only gave uh, equal rights to all citizens, but we also created special constitutional protections for safeguarding the rights of scheduled tribes to land, and also special affirmative action and special representation provisions for them. So we not only have a constitution which was pioneering in terms of giving rights to everyone, we also created specialized regimes of rights for particular groups, and the scheduled tribes were one of them. The scheduled castes were another group uh, within that. But, the, the, and, but we find that the scheduled tribes, even with all these layers of special protections, continue to remain the most displaced, most vulnerable, and impoverished of all groups in India. So the, real, so the question we started out with five years ago is, why is this the case? What are the scheduled tribes? Scheduled tribes comprise of heterogeneous tribal groups that have historically been outside the mainstream of Hindu society, both as identified by the state and as self-identified by them, both because of their distinctive culture and way of life as a group, which makes them identify themselves as being outside the mainstream of society, but also, uh, also because of their geographical isolation. Um, Article 366, Clause 25, uh, read with Article 342 of the Constitution, vests the president with enormous powers uh, to declare by public notification the tribes or tribal communities that would be considered as scheduled tribes for a state or union territory. So we are already seeing a lot of power with the president, a very centralized power, to decide what are scheduled tribes uh, within a particular state and a uh, union territory. So the power vests in a very centralized way, but the declaration of scheduled tribes is very much uh, on a state and on a union territory basis. So some groups may be scheduled tribes in one state, but may not be scheduled tribes in another. Next slide. So we find that all of us as citizens have individual rights in the Constitution. But at the same time, the Constitution also recognizes rights of groups, uh, minority groups. We see that in the case of both ethnic and religious minorities, but also in the case of the scheduled tribes. So the scheduled tribes are one of the many groups that have this kind of individual and group representation within the federal constitutional framework. And this uh, shows itself in the following ways. Firstly, they have separately reserved electoral constituencies in parliament and state assemblies in tribal dominated areas. The only other group which has this privilege are scheduled castes. Then, uh, they also have proportionate population reservations in educational institutions and government jobs. 
So the proportion uh, of the scheduled tribes in the population at the time of the drafting of the constitution was 7%. And uh, this protection is also available to the scheduled castes, whose population was 15%. So that's how their seats have been reserved. But the, but the, but the point in yellow is the point that actually uh, you know, is, is what distinguishes the scheduled tribes from all other communities, because they are the only communities that have specialized uh, fifth, uh, protections under the fifth and sixth schedule uh, to rights to land and natural resources in tribal-dominated areas of India. So fifth schedule uh, covers tribal-dominated areas in peninsula India, and the sixth schedule refers to uh, tribal areas in the northeast. But so they are the only group in, in India who actually have special protection of rights to land. And yet they continue to remain the most vulnerable and impoverished. So why is this the case? Next. And as we see, there are actually two dif differential regimes for scheduled tribes and for scheduled areas. So who, the scheduled tribes were originally declared uh, by uh, orders that were made in 1950 and 1951, the Constitution uh, Scheduled Tribes Part A and Part B States Order of 1950 and the Part C States Order of 1951. There have been many subsequent orders by the president following state reorganization, which has resulted in more and more tribes to be declared as scheduled tribes and also changes in, you know, in, the, in those tribal communities. So the original order actually declared 744 tribes, uh, original orders, the three of them together, originally declared 744 tribes in 22 states of India. But today we have se about 750 tribes in 26 states and six union territories in India. Uh, there were no uh, declaration of, uh, you know, of uh, scheduled tribes in union territories but only after several committee reports that that actually happened. So today we have 750 tribes. And scheduled tribes have increased in their percentage of the population. They were 7% at the time of um, uh, the drafting of the constitution. They are 8.6% of the population today, which amounts to 10.43 crore people. So it's a lot of people uh, that are uh, you know, falling within this uh, classification. The reason, uh, it's interesting, the reason why we have this uh, description of scheduled tribes is because they are, it's an extremely heterogeneous community. It's been very hard to come to a definition of tribe which would capture all of them. So essentially, both the British state and the Indian state have followed this policy of, of declaring through schedules who the tribes are. The second legal regime is that uh, applicable to the scheduled areas, which is contained in Article 244 of the Constitution, read with the fifth and sixth schedule. Now, interestingly here, we have no estimates at least we didn't have any estimates before we began this work as to how much geographical land of India is within the scheduled area and uh, you know how that works. We've actually calculated that and that's something you'll find in this report. Um, so, uh, but, but we see that, and the reason why there are two differential things is because people and land are not uh, completely uh, you know, fixed. So you have people who, uh, who are moving beyond tribal dominated areas and that was always the case. It was always the case even during the British rule. It has been more case uh, now with both in migration and out migration or out of the scheduled areas. The fifth schedule applies to the administration of tribal majority areas in 10 states in peninsula India which have tribal minority population which means that the population of these states is actually in a minority as compared to the rest of the population of the state. And these states are the states of Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Gujarat, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, Himachal Pradesh, Madhya, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, Odisha and Rajasthan. The, what we find is that there is a highly centralized administration in these scheduled areas just like the president can declare uh, can declare who is going to be a scheduled tribe. Similarly, the president can declare any area as scheduled area. Moreover, it is the governor of the state who is a representative of the president and responsible and answerable to the president who can regulate the application of laws and make new regulations for the scheduled areas. This applies to both parliamentary and state laws. The governor can decide, okay, this law applies to the scheduled areas, this law doesn't apply, and he can also make special regulations for the scheduled areas. The central nodal agency in, from the executive branch for the, for the tribal uh, areas from 1950 to 1999, this was actually a department within the Ministry of Home Affairs. It was not until 1999 that we actually created a separate ministry to take care of the interests of the tribals, and this is the Ministry of Tribal Affairs. Mm -hmm. But we also have state-level nodal agencies which work better, which, which are more there in some states than in others. But we have, or, or, of, in some states, we have the Minister for Tribal Welfare, and we have a Secretariat and a, a Directorate for Decision-Making and Coordinating of, uh, of Policies and Rules. But also at the district and block level in many uh, states, like in Andhra Pradesh, we have these integrated tribal development projects and agencies, the ITDA, ITDPs, which do a lot of the administration of these areas. 
What we also have is that pursuant to the constitutional protections, we have land transfer prohibition laws in all the scheduled area states. So essentially the constitution safeguarded the rights of the tribals to land and pursuant to this land transfer prohibition laws were uh, enacted in all of the 10 states that I mentioned in the fifth scheduled areas. In addition, states like uh, Uttar Pradesh, West Bengal and Sikkim that do not have designated scheduled areas have also enacted laws to protect transfer of land from tribal to non-tribal people. To, in order to safeguard the rights of tribals to uh, land and natural resources. Uh, in uh, post-1990, after the Ministry of Tribal Affairs was uh, created, we have the enactment of the Panchayat Extension to Scheduled Areas Act, which extended the, the local government uh, provisions under the 72nd and 73rd Amendments to the Constitution to devolve greater political autonomy to panchayats and gram sabhas within the scheduled areas. Uh, however, this was a, an umbrella law, which actually, uh, you know, states were supposed to, sort of within a year of its enactment, actually do things to incorporate various provisions, and there have been differential degrees to which states have actually done that. And finally, we also have the Forest Rights Act of 2006, which uh, seeks to safeguard the rights of scheduled tribes and other forest dwelling uh, to communities to forest land specifically. Next. The six scheduled areas apply to the administration of tribal majority, uh, majority areas in northeastern states of Assam, Meghalaya, Mizoram, and Tripura. Of these states, Meghalaya, almost the entire area of Meghalaya is actually a uh, scheduled area. And, uh, you know, except the Shillong Township and uh, rest of it is scheduled area. Meghalaya also is a tribal majority state along with Mizoram, whereas Assam and Tripura are not tribal majority states. Uh, the sixth schedule provided for significantly more autonomy as compared to the fifth schedule. It provides for the constitution of autonomous district councils in autonomous regions within districts uh, for areas that are not, the entire district is not a scheduled area, so for the regions within those districts. And these district councils in autonomous regions have legislative, some legislative powers, some taxation powers, some administrative powers, and even limited powers to set up courts with respect to land, revenue, forests, education, and public health. So there is a uh, considerable autonomy uh, with respect to these areas. The ma this map uh, represents the states of India which actually have fifth schedule areas. Uh, so the ones in pink are the ones that have fifth schedule areas and the ones in green are the ones that have sixth scheduled areas. Uh, can we just go back to the map again? So we see that, you know, for instance, UP, West Bengal, these states, they do not have uh, scheduled areas, but they do have uh, tribal populations. So that's why they have enacted those land transfer laws. So that brings us to the central problem, which is that of poverty, landlessness, and displacement amongst the scheduled tribes. So just to give a few statistics to put this into perspective. Next. So... Uh, you know, there is a lot of debate about the calculation of the poverty line in India, but taking the estimate of the Tendulkar Committee, we have that uh, in rural India, 33% of the population is below the poverty line. However, the number is much higher for the scheduled tribes. Uh, it's 47.4%. With respect to landless households, we find that 7.4% of uh, Indian uh, households are landless. But despite specialized protections to land, we find that much more than that, 9.4% of, uh, of, uh, of scheduled tribes are landless. So, so what's going on? I mean, is our, uh, our constitution and the protections are not clearly, are, are not working because we have these uh, specialized rights for only one group in the country. We have laws that protect those rights. It's not just the constitution, you know. Things are being done through the, uh, through the laws, but th yet they remain the most uh, landless. Next. Oh, it's going back. Oh, it's going back. Sorry. Even worse than the, the statistics on poverty and landlessness are the statistics on displacement. And while that was from, uh, you know, the government data national sample survey, but this is from uh, secondary sources, but we know that 50 million internally displaced people in India uh, exist due to dams, mines, industrial development, and wildlife sanctuaries and natural parks. 50 million internally displaced people. And scheduled tribes, even though they consist of only 8.6% of the total population, they constitute 40% of displaced people during the period 1950 to 1999, which is the period for which we have the data. So clearly, there's a, these people are disproportionately bearing the burden of economic development. Yeah. Next. 
So, uh, you know, as, as part of this project, when we started out, we realized that much of the primary data you need to actually interrogate these questions just simply didn't exist. For instance, when we talk about the extensive role that the governor is playing in the, in the administration of these scheduled areas, one would at least like to know what the governor is reporting to the president. The governor is supposed to make a report annually to the president about uh, the measures that have been taken within the scheduled areas and what is happening and what not. But we realized that these debates, uh, that these reports were simply not available in the public domain. So, so we uh, tried to, you know, uh, see if there was a way of getting them, and ultimately we went to the Right to Information Act to actually try and obtain these reports, and we did. And we filed these, uh, we filed the RTI requests with uh, with the Ministry of Home Affairs because a former governor uh, advised us that that would be the right way to go. Our requests were transferred to the Ministry of Tribal Affairs, and uh, through a, you know coordination with the public information officers there, we were able to get access to the following reports for the states of Chhattisgarh, Himachal Pradesh, Gujarat, Jharkhand, Madhya Pradesh, and Maharashtra. And these reports are now available on our CPR Land Rights Initiative website. They have been since the time we got them. However, it may be noted here that you know uh, the Ministry of Tribal Affairs lists a certain number of reports which have actually been received by them. So it is not. That's also not a very extensive list. One would think that you know the governor is charged with this responsibility to do it every year. They should actually have reports from 1950 onwards, but they have a very limited list of reports that have been received by them. But unfortunately, uh, they were not able to provide us all the reports that were re that were received by them. Um, and that, and I, and I don't even think that it was necessarily a question of, uh, of uh, unwillingness. It was more a question of inability. I don't think that they had proper records of all the reports. But uh, one also, uh, but, but this is a constitutional obligation. It's the highest obligation of its kind for, uh, for the reports to be sent. But we have these reports. They're on our website. They're available for public use. Next. The second uh, compilation we made of, was of the policy and legal architecture, which has also uh, you know, uh, not been the easiest, because a lot of important committee reports on the scheduled uh, tribes are simply uh, you know, not uh, necessarily in the public domain. Next. We, uh, we are, uh, in the, as part of our land laws project, we are also trying to compile all uh, laws applicable to the seven project states uh, that we'll be talking about tomorrow. But we have compiled laws applicable to scheduled areas in all 14, 15, and 6 scheduled area states, the ones that I mentioned there. We also tried to compile a database of Supreme Court and High Court cases on the scheduled areas from various legal archives and compiled the government committee reports pertaining to scheduled areas and STs from various uh, government archives. A lot of that information, uh, uh, some of that, about, uh, say, 70% of the information that we've collected is probably in this report. But like I said, we're still mining a lot of the primary data, and there's more to come uh, if we have support to continue the work. So now coming to the secondary data findings that we have uh, you know, analyzed based on our work. Uh, so for that, uh, for the first few findings, I will turn over to my colleague Ankit. Hello everyone. So, uh, as we highlighted, like uh, there was a complete dearth of the of the primary data around this subject to get a sense of what is going on even after the protection which was given in 1950s. It's been 65 years, and we just wanted to evaluate what is happening in the scheduled areas, specifically with with respect to scheduled tribes. But also, as we know that there are, there are people who are not scheduled tribes are also residing in the scheduled areas. So we started this process by trying to understand that which are what is the current demarcation of the scheduled areas in a country as per the latest administrative courts. And for that, we realized on 2011 census. A uh, census provides location codes for all the administrative zones in our country, including districts, sub-districts, and even at the level of villages. So when we started this exercise, we relied on the Ministry of Tribal Affairs annual report, which gave a detail of all the demarcated scheduled areas. It's a statewide uh, state listing of all the scheduled areas in different states. And when we started this thing, so what happened? The demarcation, as some of you may know, is at different levels for different states. For example, in case of Andhra Pradesh, it is in the form of a term which is called Vishakhapatnam agency areas. So agency areas were some historical terms, and still the listing is in that form. So those terms has not been, uh, I mean, they have not been reshaped as per the current status. Like, what do the agency area mean in a country right now? 
again in case of uh, Andhra Pradesh and Maharashtra, they were listing in, at the level of the villages. For example, in Andhra Pradesh, there are around four to 5,000 villages individually which are demarcated as scheduled areas. And this demarcation was in 1950s. So over the time, so many villages, they would have been merged, split, or even uh, been uh, shifted to the urban area. So all those changes which have taken place in 60, 65 years are not reflected in these things. So we started this exercise by putting all these things together as per 2011 census. Now again the separate level of challenge for the six scheduled areas was for the autonomous district councils. Now over the six scheduled areas are demarcated as ADCs but ADCs are not all the time uh, uh, they run parallelly to the districts or sub district they are generally overlapping or sometime even even they run around different taluks and different districts so mapping at that level with the current courts was really challenging for us but we have tried our best and uh, at, at the end of this exercise what we have been able to do we have been able to completely map uh, the scheduled areas for 12 states it, uh, except for Andhra Pradesh which is a fifth scheduled area because there is a lot of the information is not available like what has happened in like 65 years and for Tripura for that the boundaries are not clear for us but apart from that for all the other 12 states we have been able to completely uh, map the scheduled areas as per the latest 2011 census code so based on our analysis, we find that uh, uh, since census 2011 has 640 districts in our country, out of that 123 districts fall in, uh, have scheduled areas within them. Uh, out of 123, 104 have fifth scheduled areas, which are shown in pink on the right side of the map. And there are 19 districts which have six scheduled areas, which are highlighted in green uh, on the map. So out of the 123 districts that we have, we wanted to see, as I said, that the demarcation is not at the level of district. It is, in many cases, at the level of villages, at the level of sub-districts. So we wanted to see like how many of these districts are completely scheduled areas and how many are partially scheduled areas. So out of 123 districts, we find that 51 districts, 51 districts which is shown, which is shown in dark color on the map, are completely scheduled areas. but there are 72 districts which are partially scheduled areas. That is a sub-component within them. It may be a village, it may be a sub-taluk, is a scheduled area. So after we completed this exercise, we just wanted to put together some basic metrics on what is the extent of geographical area that falls within scheduled areas, what is the total number of population of our country which is living there, and what is, most importantly, what is the proportion of ST population that is living in the scheduled areas. So based on this ex extensive exercise, this is a summary table of our findings. So we find that roughly around 13% of the country's total area falls within scheduled areas. Around 6.3% of the total population of a country resides within scheduled areas. But only 44, around but only 40% of the total ST population of a country resides within scheduled areas. But there are some assumptions that we have taken in our methodology that is for the uh, like for example in Andhra Pradesh and Maharashtra where we were not able to map the villages. What we did, we tried to take the rural component of the relevant sub-district so that our estimates are as uh, nearer to the true position as possible. But in the due process, if we are able to map and if that information is available at the village level, these estimates will even further improve. So in this slide, these estimates should be seen as the upper bound, that is the maximum possibility for each of the indicators. So based on this, we try to put this map in this map, which is showing the relative proportion of the geographical area, which falls under scheduled areas for different states. We can see uh, for the Meghalaya, as it is entirely a scheduled area, it has more than 75%. But apart from that, if you see Chhattisgarh, uh, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, and Tripura have the have around more than a majority, 50 to 75 percent of the area falls within scheduled areas. And then there are states which have less number of area, the least being the Rajasthan, which is only around five percent of the total area which falls in the scheduled areas. So once we were able to do this district level mapping, we wanted to see what is the overlap of the natural resources because the entire contest is about the natural resources. These areas are highly rich in the natural resources. So for our analysis, we have tried to understand the role of the forest, the role of the mining activities over there, and of dams. Because dams constitute a very large proportion of the people, th those who are being displaced over there. 
So in this first finding, which is for the forest, the right hand side map shows the distribution of the forest cover in the in all the 640 districts of our country. And we see and we find that forests are roughly around 21 percent of the total geographical area of our country. But they are like 38 percent of the total forest cover of India lies in the scheduled areas. And now scheduled areas only 123 districts of the 640 district and they have like 38 percent of the scheduled areas. So the intensity of forest is like around 2.5 times than any than other districts which are not scheduled areas. So the coverage of forest the intensity of forest is significantly higher in scheduled area district as compared to other districts. Next, we wanted to see what is happening in terms of the mining activity. Now, this data at the mining, this, the data about the mining is at the level of the state because we were not able to find a consistent data that we were able to compare across different districts across time for all the districts in our country. So we tried to limit this study at the level of the state. But the, the trend that is coming out will be relatively clear. Uh, but it must be seen as an exaggeration or an overestimate because it's at the level of the state. And the scheduled areas are demarcated at the level of district and even at the level of sub-districts. But we find that in terms of the total value of the mineral production that is going on in 2015 and 16, we find that around 65% of the mineral production is coming from scheduled area states, which is significantly very high because they only constitute 14 out of the 36 administrative unit uh, administrative units in a country they constitute around 65 percent of the mineral production in terms of the mines that how many mines are there we find that around 70 percent of the mines this is for the major minerals which are reported in our country this does not take into consideration the illegal mining and the other things which are the associated activities but the reported mines which is for the major minerals the 70 percent of those mines are in the fifth scheduled area states now this again shows a disproportionately high number of mines in these states and in these areas next as a third metric to understand the, the intensity of mining, we try to use a metric of royalty accrual, that is how much of the revenue is coming to the state when uh, uh, due to this mining, uh, mining activities. We found that 89% of the royalties which is going to the state comes from fifth scheduled area states. So we see our, uh, the, mining, uh, the, the intensity of mining is significantly higher in these states as compared to other states. Uh, we could not compile a district level district level data, but uh, but the, from a from a, st a report on Center of so Science and Environment, we find that they compiled a list of the top 50 districts mining districts in our country. Out of the 27 districts, are six are scheduled area districts. So again, if you try to to draw a correlation between them, the state level data gives us a broad trend. But again, a district level data which other organizations have put together, we find that again mining is significantly higher in scheduled area states. So in terms of the, the third natural resource, that is dams, how many dams are there in our country? So this is, the, this is a unique compilation that we have been able to put together. We took this data from two different sources, tried to put it together. And at the end of the exercise, we were able to map 3,830 dams of our country at the level of districts. And on the right side, we show the geographical uh, the, geog the geospatial representation of these dams. And we find that a lot of dams, a lot of dams are in Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, and Gujarat. Now, dams in this category count for dams of national importance and large dams. So we do not include uh, the smaller <coughs> projects on dam uh, in this just because they are not comparable with the dams of national importance. So we have removed those parts, but still we have a data of 3,830 dams. And again, we find that roughly around 38% of the total dams in a country fall within scheduled area districts. And same goes, the, the intensity is again very high, that is roughly two and a half times. But an interesting point to see between dams and the previous gra graph of the forest is that the intensity of dams is significantly, is, is highly skewed towards the western part of our country, whereas the forest cover is, is a lot on the eastern part of our country. So both of them are problem, but they may be problem in different areas. We need to understand that what is happening at the local level. This is a macro picture of the resources in our country, but a more nuanced study can be, we can understand it by seeing at the local level what is happening in different regions, which, what is displacing and what is the cause of the problem. So based on this, like we find that 25 percent of the dams of national importance, these are the huge dams of a country which are generally reported in the news and media. They cause huge displacements, fall within scheduled area districts. But the uh, large dams, which are relatively smaller, but still 
uh, a big entity. There are around 38% of those dams fall in the scheduled area districts. Now we try to see of all the dams that are in scheduled area, that is a 38% dams, where are they? So we find that Maharashtra has around 42% of those dams which are in scheduled areas. So and second being Madhya Pradesh, that is they have around one, a quarter of those dams, 25%, and rest are the other districts, uh, other districts and states which have these dams. The map on the right side shows that within state was what is happening, like how many dams that a state has and how many of them are in scheduled area districts and how many are in non-scheduled area districts. So in that we find that Tripura and Meghalaya is showing 100%, but it is because that Meghalaya is entirely a scheduled area, so all the dams are there. And Tripura is essentially because in our database Tripura counted only for one dam, and that happens to fall in the scheduled area. So that being an outlier, but for the fifth scheduled area states, if you see, Chhattisgarh has around 96% of all its dam in scheduled area districts. Uh, being followed by Jharkhand and Odisha. Jharkhand, Odisha and Madhya Pradesh, they have the majority of their dams in scheduled area districts as compared to non-scheduled area districts. Thank you, Ankit. So, uh, with, so as, as I was saying at the beginning, a lot of time and energy actually went in creating uh, this, these primary data work. But what it helps us, though, is that the base is ready now. So correlations between different things can actually now be drawn. Uh, and, but it was, um, uh, you know, th that was the most time-consuming part of the exercise. And so, but with this uh, data in place, uh, we can actually think about what are the main reasons for displacement and impoverishment of scheduled tribes. So some findings on that uh, I'll just present now. The first thing we find is that there are, uh, there are two contradictory narratives of identity and development. One is an identity-based narrative of isolation. So we've, in the report, we've actually uh, tracked the British state's policy towards the scheduled tribes starting from the uh, 1871 census, which for the first time classified tribes within that uh, within uh, within mainstream society. And you know, the British uh, state had a lot of problems trying to classify tribal communities, both within Indian society and outside. And uh, what we find is that even as, uh, so the British state's policy towards tribal areas led partly in, uh, because of tribal rebellions and so on, was essentially to treat these areas, which in, uh, these communities, which anyways were living in geographically isolated areas as, uh, you know, to keep that policy of isolation. So basically these areas were, these people were identified based on their identity as being outside that of the mainstream, having certain traits of culture, which at that time were, you know, it's a politically incorrect term now, but it is what they used, primitive traits, as well as uh, their uh, shyness from contact with the larger community and the mainstream population as well as their geographic isolation. So the, so the continuing through the policy and, and legal initiatives that the British state took, we, we have this narrative of identity-based isolation, isolating the scheduled tribes to protect them from mainstream Indian society, while, while at the same time the British state extended uh, its, its power over uh, the natural resources within these uh, societies through its land acquisition, forest, and mining laws. So we see these two things happening together. We have the 1854 forest rights policy, which you know talks about the tribal rights and uh, uh, privileges of the community. Maybe we can go to the next slide. Uh, the tribal rights and uh, privileges of the tribals. It's still recognizing tribal rights and privileges over forest produce. By the 18, uh, by the uh, by the enactment of the 1868 and 1878 Forest Rights Act, that sort of goes out of the window. Uh, from tribal rights to it becomes tribal privileges. Later on, the, the Indian state actually makes it uh, concessions. So you know we see a constant dilution of the rights of tribals to resources within these areas. Even as these areas are created, so the Scheduled Districts Act is from 18. Which creates them as scheduled districts, which where again the governor has uh, complete power uh, to administer the, these areas. So keep them isolated based on identity, but the state exercises control over its natural resources through the exercise of its power of eminent domain. Now this continues up until the 1930 Simon Commission report. Um, and the Government of India Act, we see different changes through that. First, we have, you know, in the Government of India Act of 1919, we have the excluded and partially excluded areas. And then in the Government of India Act of 1935, we have, uh, we have uh, you know, this uh, classification of excluded areas again. Uh, but now there is, uh, there is a pushback against this narrative. So on the one hand, you have the British state and British anthropologists like Elvin and Crickson and so on, who are talking about 
that we need to protect the tribals from the rest of the Indian population. We need to keep them isolated. On the other side, we have the Indian National Congress, who are saying that you know this is this policy of identity-based isolation is another British attempt to divide the country, which they have been doing for all this time, and uh, and it's a cynical ploy for actually them to keep control of the resources, even as they marginalize these communities. The way forward for the tribals is actually integration and development. That these people are marginalized, and there is also some recognition on part of the British state that complete isolation, perpetual isolation, which had been the policy. For about 60 years from 1870 to 1930 is simply not the way forward. So, uh, so, on the, so there is a debate that then happens between this period uh, in, from 1930 to 1947 between these two narratives. Which, so from 1930 is this development through integration narrative sort of, which I, these are terms that I have uh, coined to, to identify these narratives, but essentially uh, that's how uh, you know, the debate is proceeding up until the Constituent Assembly where we have uh, these four intersecting narratives of identity, development, representation, and land rights. Now, what we find in the Constituent Assembly is that uh, so between these two narratives, there is a tribal voice, which comes up around 1937 in the, in the words of the Adivasi Mahasabha. And you have Jaipal Singh, who is then also a member of the Constituent Assembly, who actually support the identity-based isolation narrative at that point in time, who do not support the development through integration narrative that is being espoused by most of the other people. And so, but you know, the, the reason why the tribal situation is very difficult is because on, you know, when you have a dominant hegemonic mainstream and you have a community which is outside that mainstream, which is opposed to the, everything uh, within that community's um, you know, hege hegemony, uh, then it becomes very difficult for it to succeed. So. Let me explain this. So we have identity where, uh, you know, different people, India is not, not at all a homogeneous society. We have a heterogeneous society. People are claiming different rights. You know, we have religious minorities. We have ethnic minorities. We have castes. We have all of that. But all of them are part of the mainstream of Indian society in the sense that they all want their special rights, but they are part of the mainstream. Whereas the tribal way of life was always different and distinctive from that of the mainstream. And they wanted to keep their identity as such. Now, if we compare the scheduled castes on the one hand and the scheduled tribes, uh, you know, they're often lumped together. And that has been actually the policy of the Indian state post-independence. Uh, but actually, the tribal narrative is very different from the Dalit narrative. So the Dalit narrative is one of historic discrimination within Hindu society. That, you know, these communities have been historically excluded. But the tribal narrative is that they want to be outs outside Indian society. They have been, they want to be. So th these two narratives, one is of historic discrimination and one is of historic isolation. And there are two different narratives and yet, you know, so, so development through integration may be something which the scheduled castes may perhaps be more amenable to because that's what they've actually wanted, respect and dignity within Hindu society. Tribals have not necessarily identified themselves with Hindu society. So on that first metric, they're outside. Then on development itself, there, there are different, uh, so there is definitely a certain uh, view of development which is there uh, on part of the state and also amongst tribal communities. It's Tribal communities are not just heterogeneous in terms of different tribal groups. We have 750 tribal groups. There is also intergenerational differences that are, oft, that are more and more coming up between what the younger generation wants and what the older generation wants. On representation, all of us have individual representation. Tribals have group representation. And on land rights, we all have individual land rights, but they have community, property, and so on. So on all these ideas, they were against the dominant mainstream. And these are the four intersecting narratives that are taking place in the Constituent Assembly. Can you move to the next slide? So this just shows uh, the different narratives that have dominated in different periods of time. Between 1868 and 1947, we have this identity-based isolation approach towards the tribal communities, which we see. Then in the constituent assembly debates, we see both these narratives, because it's only after 1930 that this development through integration narrative comes up. Even for the Congress, which is espousing the rights of all various communities, the tribal issue doesn't come up until the very end. You know, it's not, it's not a dominant narrative within the rights of various communities. You know, we have the Muslim question, we have the rights of various minorities, but not the tribals until very late in the game. But when it does come up, we have these two competing views, and you see this in the debates that happen, and you know, that's also there in the report, where we talk about, on the one hand, Jaipal, Jaipal Singh, who is the uh, who's a Munda from the Munda tribe in, in, in South Bihar and he's actually talking about the fact that tribals need uh, identity-based isolation. On the other hand, we have people like Shibin Lal Saxena and Rajeshwar Prasad who are saying that no, the way forward is development through integration, that's what we need to do and that's what the state needs to do. And K. Munshi is the one who asks the really important question which has actually affected the tribal uh, cause in India is that there is no conscious corporate collective whole of tribals. Who speaks for the tribals? These are 750 tribes. How do we know what the tribal people want? There is not one group who speaks for them. 
Uh, and as we see in the assembly, we, are there, we have very few people who are actually tribals in that debate. There's Jaipal Singh from the fifth schedule, the sixth schedule, actually we have a Christian missionary who's actually uh, part of those debates. Uh, when we when we uh, look into the independent Indian state, so these are the two competing narratives, but post-1950, uh, under when the Ministry of Home Affairs is actually the nodal ministry, if you look at the various committee reports that have come out, the Kalilkar, Dhebar, Renuka Ray Committee, and the Lokur Committee, they basically treat tribals as backward communities. And they lump them together with scheduled caste, with women, and so on. So the idea is that how do we bring all these backward communities to development through integration? And this question of identity-based isolation doesn't really stay. And, and that also shows in India's participation on the international plane because India is a signatory to the ILO Convention on Indigenous and Tribal Populations of 1957 uh, because that convention was based on an integrationist approach. It said things like tribals are primitive people, they have to be brought up to power and so on. But India did not sign the ILO Convention on Indigenous and Tribal Peoples of 1989 which was based on recognition of tribal identity and the right to all uh, to self-identification uh, and self-autonomy. Uh, and that's also because the Indian state has uh, never recognized the sovereignty of tribal peoples over land and natural resources within these areas. The British state didn't do it. The Indian state hasn't done it. The, in fact, uh, like I mentioned, the Indian forest policy of 1952 even diluted the forest rights of the tribals further by saying that these are not tribal rights and privileges, they're actually tribal rights and concessions. And that policy continues until uh, you know the, the forest policy of 1988. And after that, you know we have the Forest Rights Act that eventually comes and redresses the historic injustice that has been done to the tribals. But the, but the stand of the Indian state, both nationally and internationally, has always been very clear. There's no tribal sovereignty. Even in the Constituent Assembly debates, apart from one reference by Dr. B.R. Ambedkar, who's obviously the president of the drafting committee, saying that you know the position of the six schedules is somewhat similar to that of the Red, Ind Red Indians in the US, who again do not have re real sovereignty over their lands. There's just one reference to that. There is no re reference at all to the fact that they have sovereignty at all. What is even more important is that there is no, without question, we, the Indian state continues the 1894 land acquisition law, it continues all the forest laws, it continues uh, the mining laws in 1952, they make the My Mineral uh, Development Regulation Act, and the assertion of the British state that they have the rights over forest, water resources, mineral resources under the subsoil is completely continued by the Indian state without any questions. So we inherit the rights of the British state. And the British state had actually said that they inherited the rights of kings in that respect. And there's a lot of question as to all of that is really true, but that's the assertion, that's the claim, and that's what the Constitution says. Mm -hmm. So, the next one. The next finding, the next problem, so this is the first problem, is that there are two fundamental narratives. You can't have identity-based isolation and development through integration as a policy thing, so we have to have a coherent policy discourse where we actually try to figure out what is it that the tribal people want. Uh, the second problem is that there is no unified tribal identity. This is what K. Munshi identified in the debates. Uh, between either the 750 listed scheduled tribes or the denotified tribes. Now I just want to quickly mention the denotified tribes because these were the erstwhile criminal tribes. We make a reference to these communities within the report because if uh, some, if the scheduled tribes have lost out, these people have uh, probably lost out even more. Uh, can you imagine a community which for like almost, uh, uh, almost 60 years, from 18, 1871 is when they are also criminalized. Same time as they, uh, the British state creates a scheduled districts act, same time they criminalize these tribes where an entire community is criminal, just every member of that community born in that community will be a cr criminal as they are born. That's the status of these people. And this decriminalization does not happen up until independence, until the 1952, uh, you know, the repeal of this act by the Habitual Offenders Act. So for about 80 years, uh, uh, you know, these people are criminal tribes. And now they are known as denotified communities. And it was not until 2008 that actually, you know, uh, we have a committee which has been specifically set up under the government to actually look into the rights of de denotified communities. So if the tribals have it bad, uh, criminal tribes, denotified tribes have it even worse. And the percentage of their population is about one crore in the is around one crore so that's not an insig insignificant number of people and we know even less about them uh, the report mentions them to that extent to bring out the fact that there hasn't been uh, anything done on that but doesn't go too much into detail that's again work for the future so there are huge variations between tribes. And what we find is that there are problems of under and over inclusion. So in the course of our field work in Andhra Pradesh, we realized that the Lambadas are recognized as scheduled tribes in Andhra Pradesh, but they're not recognized as uh, scheduled tribes, but as OBC in neighboring Maharashtra. Now, obviously, scheduled tribes uh, status gives people more privileges, also because you have less people to compete with in terms of those privileges as compared to the OBCs. So we actually find a lot of migration of the, uh, of the scheduled tribes from Maharashtra to uh, to uh, to AP 
and because their dominant communities are pretty much integrated, uh, you know, they have settled agriculture and so on, what we find is that there is a lot of displacement, intra-tribal displacement as well, that we have tribal communities displacing each other as well. Um, next one. Next. So the next point is about special political representation, and this is something that we are still developing as course in the course of our work. So again, going back to the point that the tribal communities have a group identity as opposed to individual identity, uh, which the mainstream population has with respect to electoral representation. So what we have is that under Article 330 of the Constitution with the, with the Representation of Peoples Act, we have reserved electoral constituencies for scheduled tribes in parliament and state legislative assemblies. And the Delimitation Commission, which uh, follows the 2001 census, provides for the reservation of seats based on scheduled tribe population you know, uh, in those particular districts. So those will be reserved for th those constituencies. But we find that since uh, tribals are often uh, not a majority in all the scheduled area districts, sometimes they're even a minority in the tribal dominated areas because of displacement, because of out-migration, this prevents effective representation of tribal interests in parliament and state legislatures. Moreover, we find that the, there are two issues. One is the lack of a unified tribal identity, but also a lack of a unified tribal narrative, because of perhaps in part because of that, which means that despite 50 scheduled tribe MPs in parliament, we have 50 reserved seats for scheduled tribes, they often vote against tribal interests and along party lines. I mean, 50 seats in parliament is not a small number. The Congress, the, which is the largest opposition party in India today, only has 46 seats in parliament. So if the, if the 50 tribal MPs were to work together to actually put forward a tribal interest, they would actually you know, be uh, quite successful. But we find that that doesn't happen. They tend to vote along party lines and not uh, along tribal interest. Next slide, please. And then finally, we find that the special rights to land of the tribals are pitted against a, con uh, a contrary legal regime, which has continued from British times where we have that the scheduled tribes have both individual and community rights to land as opposed to individual rights for the rest of the population. And these are rights that are safeguarded both by the constitution, by a plethora of legislation. And there are special provisions in the fifth and sixth schedules to effectuate that. But they are all negated by a framework of contrary laws through which the state actively displaces scheduled tribes. Next slide. So what we have is basically a lot of laws. And part of the Land Rights Initiative project is also to find out how many laws there actually are on land and how do they work together. That's the land laws project we'll be talking about tomorrow. But on the one hand, we have the land alienation prohibition laws and restoration of alienated land in scheduled areas. I mentioned that all the 10 fifth scheduled area states have those laws. And then, you know, uh, even states that don't have scheduled areas like UP, West Bengal and Sikkim have those laws. But at the same time, and at the same time, we have laws prohibiting money lending, which essentially, you know, money lenders, uh, because the, the idea idea was that historically money lenders would give money to scheduled tribes and then deprive them uh, of their lands. So there are laws prohibiting money lending in the scheduled areas. Then we have PESA, we have Forest Rights Act, which safeguard rights of uh, tribal communities to their land. But at the same time, on the right hand side, we see we have a series of displacing laws, the land acquisition laws, and we have, uh, you know, our land rights initiative report, uh, which was released last year, and we'll be talking about it today, later in the panel. We know that there are 102 laws of land acquisition alone in India, 102 laws of land acquisition, 87 state laws, 15 central laws. So, uh, and then we have the forest laws. And uh, even though we have the Forest Rights Act, it is not as if the earlier forest laws are completely gone. They have not been completely repealed. They still have provisions. And then there are conflicts. And then it depends. We must know that whenever there is a conflict in the laws, the government will choose to apply the law that you know they want to apply. And uh, so and, uh, until, and that, that's what then leads to litigation and so on. But essentially, we have those conflicts. Then we have a lot of mining laws, and we have the laws creating da dams. And these are the things that, you know, uh, Ankit described are, are the reasons for uh, the, the intensity of dams, mining, and forests is very high in the scheduled areas. And these are also reasons for displacement. And then we have the laws which are both protective and displacing. What does that mean? So for instance, we have laws which have uh, an administrative orders which delineate and alter the boundaries of the scheduled areas. So these laws, insofar as they extend the boundaries of the scheduled areas, they can be considered protective. But what we often find is that they keep uh, reducing the boundaries of the scheduled areas also by denotifying scheduled areas. So in that sense, they become displacing. And then we have land reform laws. And these laws recognize the reality that even at the time of, uh, at, uh, at the time of independence and the drafting of the constitution, many non-tribal communities were resident in the scheduled areas. So they'll have provisions like 
land cannot be transferred from tribal to non tribal but if you have been resident there for like uh, a certain period of time like a gen like 10 years 20 years or something then you can claim rights to that land so these laws are safeguarding the rights of the non tribal population and you know uh, in a way uh, the, then displacing the tribal population because often the non tribal population is is more dominant but these are difficult questions because at the end of the day you know we have a constitution which guarantees freedom of movement to all there is no restriction anymore of going into the tribal areas. So how do you reconcile the rights of the general population vis-a-vis -vis the special rights of the special of the tribal population, especially when the uh, the mainstream population is more dominant, both in terms of their ability to access various uh, sources of law and governance and so on. Um, so these are both protective and displacing laws, and and that's also something that we are trying to figure out. Okay, how do these laws actually connect with each other? Next. So basically what we find is that even though the scheduled tribes have individual and community rights to land and special protective provisions, we have a framework of contrary laws through which the state uh, actively displaces tribals. And even when protective laws like the Forest Rights Act are enacted, we find that administrative attitudes take long to change. So we have a lot of difficulties that you know, people are experiencing in terms of recording people's rights in the Pattas under the Forest Rights Act. And, and this happens because we have significant legal and institutional continuities between the colonial and the post-colonial Indian state, especially in terms of the state's eminent domain powers over natural resources, which are very much predominant in the scheduled areas. Next. So uh, the next bit is on shortfalls in financial allocations and expenditure for ST welfare. So I'll turn that over to um, So. So, so the concept of the scheduled areas started in 1950s, but I think there was a realization that there is a significant number of people or uh, the ST population which is living outside the scheduled areas. So government, there was a shift in the government policy and in terms of the financial, financially, I mean how to create the outlays, how to create the programs which can be which can be useful for the overall development of the tribal population. In the fifth year plan in 1974, the, the introduction of the tribal sub plan was one of that one of that important measure that was taken place. So TSPs are generally covered around in 23 states in our country. And just to highlight, the TSP is a is a broader is the implication of the TSP is broader than just in the scheduled areas. They generally are used as a financial resources to to uplift the overall development of the tribal community, not just in scheduled areas but also in ITDAs, ITDPs. Murder pockets and even PBTGs. So, so the calculations that we are going to show has to be seen in the context of the overall population of the tribal population, but uh, of which the scheduled areas is just one of the component. Uh, so, on the right, we we want we wanted to just evaluate like what has been happening in the recent years. So, we collected some data on last five years, and we see that there is a consistent improvement in the TSP allocation from 2012 to 17. It is in 2012-13 it was around 76,000 crore rupees. Uh, and in 2016-17, as per the latest budget estimates, it's around 1,29,000 crore rupees. So consistently, it's a good thing that the TSP allocations have gone up. And they have gone up by a CAGR of around 14% uh, in this four or five years. But it's a very short duration. So we do not know what is the overall picture. But in the latest years, it's a, it's a good positive move in that way. Now we try to break the entire TSP, the TSP has different components within it. It has a component on the central TSP under which the different ministries of the central government provide some funds. Then we have a component on state TSP, that is where the state governments put some funds and then there is Ministry of Tribal, Affair, uh, Tribal Affairs which tries to play like a role of a uh, wherever there is a shortfall, Ministry of Tribal Affairs try to put some money. If we try to see the overall contribution of these relative components from 2012 to 17, we find that roughly around 80% of the contribution is coming from state TSP. As compared to the rest, 20% which is divided like 18% is from central TSP and roughly around 3% is from uh, Ministry of Tribal Affairs. But when we try to divide this thing uh, over a period from 2012 to 16, we see that there is some the the, the, the trend is changing. Uh, in terms of the the relative proportion of the central TSP, that is a green bar on the right, is coming down. It from 26% to roughly around 15% in the recent years, and that of the state TSP is going up from around. 71% uh, to 81 or 82% in the recent years. So there is a shift in the terms of the TSP allocation is going up, but also who is contributing proportionately more. So the dependence on the state governments is growing more and more as compared to the central ministries. So they are contributing more and more. And this is a very interesting uh, thing to see like, why this is happening. Is it good? It is bad? That is open for discussion right now. 
So after we have uh, seen that it's around 1 lakh 30 thousand crore rupees that is being allocated in the recent years, what we wanted to evaluate like is it is it the sufficient amount or are there some variations can it be done better or is it I mean what is happening so we try to compare the different components that is state TSP and central TSP since the since they constitute around 97% of the entire TSP with the so planning commission came out with some guidelines in 2006 which were revised in 2014 they give some guidelines like how these funds have to be created how they have to be used and how much allocations that the state governments and the central ministries should make based on that guideline we find that there is a shortfall in terms of what is being allocated to what should have been allocated and we find that in, in case of state TSP from 2011 to 16 for which you are able to find this consistent data we find that there is a shortfall of around 45,000 crore rupees in this five to five years time in case of central TSP when we do this similar analysis for the central ministries we find that for the period from 2013 to 17 the shortfall is around 16,000 crore rupees now this is the calculations are based on the guidelines which the planning commission has said and based on the actual data that we have collected so we see combining the two components that the shortfall is significant and and apart from this shortfall there are also like based on the various discussions that we have with different stakeholders we find that there is a, there are also issues of in terms of how effectively the TSP component is used for the tribal development in most cases it's a it's a it's a top-down approach so the local aspirations and the, the requirements of the communities are not taken into consideration and in most time even they are misplaced fund so in terms of effecting the change the financial allocation has a serious shortfall and also not only shortfall but also a lot of misallocation of the funds and this requires further investigation. Okay, so to conclude, um, there are fundamental contradictions both in creating uh, excluded areas where there are no restrictions on the mobility of tribals and non-tribals and there is a hegemonic influence of the dominant culture. This is a problem that not just India is facing, this is a problem that all countries all over the world that have indigenous populations are facing, whether it's the US, Canada, Australia, Norway. Uh, how, do you, how do you prevent the movement of cultures and, the, and, and, and isolation when some kind of integration is inevitable against a dominant uh, culture? Um, Especially when there is no limitations on movement of people. So it was, the British could do it because they could limit movement here and there, but, we, but the Indian state allows freedom of movement, so how do we do that? The second is the contradiction between the identity-based isolation and development through integration narrative, and therefore there we need clarity on both these narratives, the first which po posits the scheduled tribes as part of the mainstream and works towards their integration, that's the development narrative, and the identity narrative which puts them outside the mainstream and seeks autonomy and isolation, so that we can have a coherent strategy for their uplift and protection of their way of life, which is happening in consultation with the tribes as opposed to a top-down approach of centralized government decision-making, as Ankit also mentioned, you know, uh, and, I'm, uh, and I also mentioned in the beginning that, you know, the administrative structure and the constitutional powers are highly centralized, the, in terms of financial allocations, we are seeing a greater dependence on state contributions. Uh, so we need to kind of think about these things together. Like if the states are the ones who are going to provide the money, then should they have more powers to decide these things? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because uh, do, do we have more trust in the central government vis-a-vis -vis the state insofar as the tribals are anyways pitted against the dominant mainstream society of that state? So these are questions we need to think about. But I think the, uh, the, uh, an equally big problem is a problem of uh, the fact that we have a constitutional, what I call a constitutional administrative state. We have a very progressive constitution, but we have significant continuities in administration between the British state and the Indian state. And although we have progressive constitution, some progressive laws, we have a lot of contrary laws, uh, particularly the land acquisition, mining, and forest laws, which, uh, which are not really progressive in terms of safeguarding the rights of the tribal people. So it's progressive laws versus contrary laws, and we need to you know, figure out where the right medium lies for equitable land rights of all com uh, communities, particularly tribals, whose identity is very much linked with, the, with their rights to land. Even in case of the protective laws, it is impossible to bring about social change through law without money. Uh, you cannot, we have to have adequate uh, finances available to the, to the rights of the tribal communities. We find that there are shortfalls even in, in the guidelines that are uh, there and we have to have appropriate coordination between the implementing agencies. Often we find that the tribal welfare department and the forest department are not necessarily agreeing with each other on the implementation of the Forest Rights Act which also impedes the recognition of the rights of the tribals. And finally we have to really uh, seriously think about the costs of development and the drain of wealth. Uh, we have uh, shown 
shown some data to show that the concentration of mineral resources in the scheduled area districts and the extensive exploitation is happening. Uh, and yet these communities remain uh, marginalized and, and landless and impoverished. So clearly there is some kind of a drain of wealth which is happening which we need to think about. Uh, if you are if you are to seriously bring about uh, uplift of the tribal communities in accordance with their aspirations and their needs in accordance with the kind of development that they want